coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, celebrity real estate agent, Good Time Tommy. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Rich Redman here. This is another exciting episode of The Rich Redman Show, coming to you live from Crash Studio, beautiful Braniac, Tennessee. As always, my co-host and co-producer is here, Jim McCarthy. hey yo. How you doing, bud? Good. Jim McCarthy, Cowbell. voiceovers.com. Com com. And big.lighting.com. Make That's note right. of those things. Now, I'm really excited about our next guest because our next guest for nearly 20 years has been a celebrity real estate agent selling over 150 homes a year in the Middle Tennessee area. Mr. Good Time Tommy. Yeah. How are thank you, pal? Thank you, thank you. Also known as Tommy Davidson, not the comedian. Right. <laughs> I had to change my name. He took up too I much love of it. my Google hey, space. Hey, speaking of comedians, <laughs> last week it was actually last night, but we're going to edit that out. Last week, I went to go see Sinbad at Zany's. That's old school. Yeah. And he was amazing. He really was. He put on a two hour show. And I had some good Zany's food. You know, if you guys are in the middle, in the Nashville area, go see Zany. Go to Zany's. It's an amazing comedy club. Mm -hmm. They got good food, good drinks. The service was a little slow last night, but hey, what are you going to do? Hey, so other good news. You got your bride in the room. Yeah. She, you're a newlywed. It's the only time she's ever wanted to come with, to something like this. It's got to be <laughs> It's got to be you. Or maybe it's Jimmy over there. I don't know. It's, uh, it's I attract. She you know saw I mean? a picture of Rich and said, hey. <laughs> Bring me with you. Meet that guy. That's right. So you guys are are new. When did this happen? Last Friday. Friday. Last Friday. Friday before. Was it like a big wedding with friends and family? It was actually very small. Wow. You know, I must have missed my invitation in the mail. So yeah. Um, one of the I things she that. said to me is, "This ain't gonna be a GTT event." <laughs> and really, when she said that, I just said, uh, "Well, I'm not gonna invite anybody." And then I'm gonna say. Your invitation got lost. Right, right. I, I, I'm just going to chalk it up to that. Well, some couples do that. They go small on the ceremony, keep that super intimate, and then maybe they'll have a big party at some point. You know, that's something we thought about, but we had it at the same place, and it yeah. was it just didn't it didn't work out that way. I think yeah. it worked out perfectly. It was maybe 125 people there, maybe 150, but oh, that's 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 a good size. That's great. That's well, it. Uh, I work for a company that has 40 people, so yeah. I had to reserve spots for them. Yeah. Understandable. I'm just busting family. your chops. You know No, that. no. Yeah. Hey, if I could have done all over again, if we do it all over again, Jim, I'll invite you. Thank okay? you. You know, and the funny thing is, what I loved about it is that you put up a highlight of the video. No, no, Tommy, no. I didn't put that up. Tommy is a very, he got very emotional at the altar. Right? Well, this, is this your I mean, first marriage? Mm, the first one that counted. Yeah. Uh, the other one was practice. I got two under my belt. I got two under my belt. <laughs> Jim's? The first one was six months. I don't even think that counts. Oh, yeah. I'm going into year 19. So so where did you guys meet? At a networking event? We met through uh, um, collectively with um, uh, Coach Burt. Oh, yeah. yeah. Your, your, your coach, Coach Burt. Coach Michael Burt, who, who, who we've had on my other podcast, Pick Which Spring. Spring. Great guy. Super yeah. knowledgeable. Monster producer. Monsterproducer.com. That's right. He was one of my groomsmen. Oh, was great. he? Mm -hmm. Nice. Now, hey, before I get started, the yeah. other day, when uh, right after my wedding, I didn't know we had a mutual friend, Dr. Christy Morgan. Oh, yeah. uh, in Phoenix? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a really small world. That is a small world. We were up uh, on the top floor of Tootsie's, and somehow you were brought up, and I'm like, you know Rich? Yeah. And uh, Was that the last time that she was here in town? Because yeah, I, she, she came in for our wedding. Oh. She, was, she came to our wedding. Okay, because about six months ago, we all went out for drinks at the Red Door because she has another uh, charity event that she works with called Candle Wishes right, right. and brought me in to MC the event. And I got that job through Jim McCarthy. Yeah, yeah, hooked you up there. See, look at how small this world is. Little bitty world. Yeah, she's, she's brilliant. And she has a TED Talk that I need to watch. Yeah, she actually has a, has a well, TEDx. Well, she did talk. one, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, she's in our program, and um, it's amazing what she's done. You know, yeah. she's a chiropractor that has evolved into a great business person mm -hmm. that somehow makes time for candle wishes, and I, that's probably the most passionate thing yeah, that that she's involved in. But yeah. I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that of because course. of how much we think of. Uh, 
the the Morgans. Thomas. Yeah. He's also a good Tom Tommy. His name's Thomas. Yeah. And uh, Christy Morgan. And they're so sweet. They sent me a bottle of um, high end whiskey and some nice cigars. It was really great. I smoked them all and drank it all. So but you know, I feel bad about myself, guys. Talk really about bad. the moment standing at the altar. Go into that a little bit. Yeah. You know, you, you got really. I mean, I've never seen you like that. It really hit you. Yeah, we can talk about that because um, <laughs> I knew I was very relaxed all the way up until kickoff, and I knew that uh, when I see when I would see her coming down the aisle, I knew it was going to be very emotional for me, and I was trying to prepare for that. Mm -hmm. But um, I was up there, and um, the the guy that was doing our wedding, I'm very comfortable with, and um, when I saw her and I heard this song, I just lost it. And I just what was the song? Down. It was um, she's country. <laughs> it was a, a Elvis song. Uh, what's the name of it, baby? Can't fall in love with you. Oh, oh, oh yeah, falling yeah, fall in oh, love yeah. with you. Yeah, that, that was the name of it. So Find as soon that. as it, as soon as it started playing, um, and I saw her. You I got just, her. In the, you got you in the feels. It did. That's it, okay. You know, it, but here's a, here's a better question. Why do you think? Whenever I saw her and the song came on, why do you think I started crying? Why do I think? Yeah. I think the moment overwhelmed you. Ride the oh, level. You're, you're. Wow. We're, we're, we're going for tears here, man. Yeah. What? <laughs> this will be the first tearful Rich Redman show, I think. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. So, <laughs> but see, that, that song had a lot of meaning to me. I'm sure. 46 years old, yeah. and you know. I've always been scared to death to to drop. I didn't even know if I could love anybody because right. oh wow because of how afraid I am or was to get hurt. And you just sometimes you don't even know if you have that emotion if you're a single kid like me that yeah. is extremely selfish. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've I've always guarded my heart. My mom and dad broke up when I was probably ten years old. And I'm, I, you don't know it at the time, but I think you you carry these wounds forever. For, oh, sure, really forever. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure all those emotions and feelings were coming up, and I didn't even know it when she was coming down the aisle. It's what I probably always wanted, and I didn't I didn't even know it. But you know what? The mark of a true man is a man who allows himself to feel emotion, and I I, I applaud you for that, man. Oh, guys, I will cry at days of our lives. I mean. You know, we Puppy were watching. videos. I just got back. You know, my in-laws were in town over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And my father-in-law and I always watch movies together. Mm -hmm. And one of the movies we watched years ago was uh, Saving Private Ryan. Right. Oh, my gosh. And I'm sitting there in the couch with my father-in-law. We're both just kind of like, yeah, yeah, I got something in my eye. Is I don't the, know about you. but That's I got the earn this? My... Earn this? That yes. was, uh, you know, tell me that at the end, he says, tell me I live my life with purpose. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. God, Spielberg. I mean, totally gets you. You know what I mean? Tell me, I lived a good, a good life. That's what he. That's what he says to his wife. You know, I probably cry mm. at happier moments in in movies yeah. than, than sad. Me too. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think it's because that's what I want. Mm -hmm. I want to experience what that what that actor or actress is going through in that moment. Yeah. And and in the way I feel it, I cry. Now, Rich, as an actor, if you had to cry on cue, well. You what? know what I? It, it's that's that's a tough one for me. Um, I'm still working on that. I'm, I don't think I'm going to get hired for a lot of those parts. I'm going to be hired for the next door neighbor, the douchey husband, the funny friend, the school teacher, the detective, the drummer with the lines, the music but, producer. Know, those but, the, that's the guys I'm going to be hired what, for. But you know, they tell you to tap into something existing. Yep. Right. What would be that moment? For you? I, when I was working on that, I took a break from it. I'm trying to look up Shawshank Redemption uh -huh. because the final scene where Andy and the Morgan Freeman's character are walk, walking on, on the Mayo and he sees his friend coming towards him, that will get me every single mm -hmm. time. Really? The end of Rocky, Adrian, that gets me, I did every, it! That gets me I every time. That. Here she's, we go. She's never seen Rocky. And no. the last time. I've never seen it either up until recently. So I hear you. I mean, I really want to see, I want to pull this up for you guys. Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> it gets me every single time. And so Morgan Freeman is walking up to his friend on the beach. 
and I'm going to try not to cry for you guys, but it's, I mean, you watch it every Thanksgiving and every Christmas. I'm so going to judge you if you do. They're smiling at each other. Big smile. They're reunited. Oh my God. Gets me every single time. Wow. There's a reason why. There's a reason why that hits you like that. There's something you want out of that. Wow. You, you want to have a friend like that in your life. And I've been kind of, lu- I've been very lucky in the sense that I ride a tour bus with my best friends. We finish each other's sentences. We, they, you know, these guys have been there for me in my life through weddings, divorces, troubled times. Well, that's why it means so much to you yeah. because these people have been there for you. Plus, Rocky is like, you know, that's the eternal feel good movie like work hard you can do you could prove the naysayers wrong yeah i love that i i up until recently i've never watched the rocky one and two mm-hmm. so a couple maybe six months ago my wife and i sat down and we watched them and i i've always picked up from rocky three so i, I only knew of the character rocky as being rich mm-hmm. so seeing him in that air in that you know, the first two was very interesting. Sure. You know what I mean? So I understand that. You know, him uh, defeating Apollo Creed in the, in, at the end of both movies uh, was something quite Now, what's the Survivor song? And, 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 Eye of the Tiger? That was, that was Rocky Three. Now, this right here, since I, and I know the composer of the song, this gets me ready for a workout. It gets me ready to kick yeah. ass in life. You guys should play this before your next Coach Burt meeting. <laughs> yeah, Apollo and Rocky running down the beach. Is I that, mean, are, that's big. Are there, is that a drum set in there? Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, a, it's a guy like. We need to see you. I got to see you. Play Maybe the drum. at the end of the at the end of this episode, we'll use your camera. We'll go over there and I'll demonstrate. We've only got about twenty minutes now. Okay, <laughs> but listen, <laughs> let's get batteries. let's get into your expertise because this really there this is such a timely episode because Nashville is one of the fastest growing cities in the world, and all of a sudden it is the place to be, the place to buy real estate. Now, if I hadn't suffered several calamities financially in my life, I would have more property. But hey, at almost 50, I got two properties. Not, doing well. not bad. Yeah. Um, let's talk about like Nashville and this market and what you do with real estate and how you separate yourself from the pack. Well, first, I, I want to look at myself as a businessman. Sure. And an entrepreneur. I, I, I'm an entrepreneur that has a skill set that specializes in selling real estate. Right. So what I'm the most passionate about is not really real estate. What I'm the most passionate about is building the people that work for me. Mm-hmm. I want to take people like him and all the other people that... I, I, Who is that gentleman? That's Von Grufton. All right. He's German. Oh, yeah? No, but <laughs> I call him that. But he's, he's, your, he's your D-Rock. He's our D-Rock. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Is that I'm Michael like, Bird's guy? Uh, no, D-Rock is the guy who follows Vaynerchuk around. Oh, okay, gotcha. Very nice. <laughs> and, he's, and he's videotapes my, everything. He's my D-Rock. He's my videographer. But I've got a vision that one day there's going to be all these people that want to come work for me because of what I've sown into myself that I can give away to other people. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's not really real estate that excites me. It's personal development. That's why we connect. That's why I mm-hmm. like you. You, Hey, hopefully like mm-hmm. me. Of course. But um, – I'm really the most interested in me growing and influencing other people to grow. So real estate's just the product. Personal development, professional development. Mm -hmm. And really, if I was to ever get my real estate license, I know it's a lot of work that goes into it. I have several friends who are musicians that do that, a lot of actor friends that do that. I know there's a lot of work associated with that, but I would be excited about, I mean, really you're in the business of changing people's lives and putting a roof over their head, something that they can, you know, live with and raise a family. I mean, that's a big responsibility. Is that what really makes you happy at the end of the day, finding the right house for the, for the, for the client? No. What <laughs> makes me happy is, <laughs> what makes me happy is helping them I think my my unique ability is helping people un- uncover what their real problem is. And whenever you come to me and helping come up with the solution is what I take pride in. Mm-hmm. So some of my favorite moments have been talking with friends. One time, 
Heather and Jeremy Bills came over and looked at a house, and I gave them the clarity that they needed to not buy the house. So I really, huh. I like having deep level discussion, having breakthroughs, and and help people go from confusion to clarity. That's where I really probably, um, well, that's what I enjoy the most. Yeah, mm-hmm. clarity is something when I was looking at your website goodtimetommy.com you said you've got a system that works every time and one of the, the three things that you like to do is you like to build trust immediately give the client confidence and clarity and then third regulate their emotions to maintain that clarity so if you lose the sale that's okay with you because ultimately you want to have a happy client a client that is has clarity to me it, I, I don't care about the house i right. just care about the relationship and i want to be the person that they trust the most mm-hmm. and you know the 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 house will take care of itself i'm just there to be their per the person that they trust the most yeah. and who they want to work with yeah because you can you can sense that in your gut right jim i mean you've sold cars and i think real estate agents and especially used car salesmen they they get you know roped into this category like ooh. You know, yeah, yeah. Sometimes, and you gotta, you know. I had this conversation yesterday, actually, and uh, they said, "Would you go back? But go back to selling cars?" I said, "You know, if I had to, I'd have to give up my weekends in order to do it." But I mean, it's, uh, you know, I'd probably come back with much more of a vigor on how to market myself and how to be the leader in my uh, market when it comes to selling cars. But I mean, for me, it was what I gleaned about selling in that business that I can now apply to other things mm-hmm. is what really helped me. I equate it to a real college education is what I, I got out of it. Because I do remember when you started selling cars and I was <clears> like, Jim, is this- What are you doing? Is this in line with your purpose in life? Right. I, didn't, I didn't feel like it was one of your, I mean, I think you're a great natural salesman, mm-hmm. but I just, I picture you as a- a drummer. I picture mm-hmm. you as a voiceover artist, and I mean, now you're you're really an entrepreneur. But I didn't. I said selling cars. I don't see that, but you, you grew from it. Oh yeah. And thank God, because every time I go to buy a car, he I take you with me. That's right. Because he knows the inner trappings of um. <laughs> we got a secret lovers I know. thing going on. Are you guys here. fighting? Are you guys having a domestic already? Yeah. Do we need to call the cops? <laughs> well, we're all, we were on Facebook Live. Oh, I, didn't, nice. I didn't want to show the whole. She's got thing. more devices over there than I'm, she knows I know. Doing. Yeah, this is why I really came. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's an entrepreneur too. Yeah, so yeah. She, she's actually she's got a little notepad. She owns a boutique in yeah. Murfreesboro, right off the square, mm-hmm. and a clothing boutique. I like those Lululemon styles pants but with there's a little bit of va va voom there on the side <laughs> there's for those of you that can't see it there's some slits in the side of her workout clothes yeah, shoes with the alligator. yeah that's great that's nice. now what, what's the story with the did you design those no 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 so i bought my girlfriend some lululemons you could have thought it was like i bought her like the the, the sword of sonara or king <laughs> king arthur's <laughs> Camelot or something. For the Lulu. Yeah, I mean, did I she lo- like them? I love. Lu- I'm a fan of Lulus. You kidding me? Well, did, did did Carol like? She them? loved them. Okay, yeah. that's good. Totally loved them. But now I got to buy a second pair because you can get the ones that go all the way down, and then you get the ones that are just like above, below your knee. They have uh-huh. different looks, different purposes. Yeah. You know, I'm a fan of those. My wife wears them too. There's nothing that frames a butt like a pair of Lululemons. <laughs> <laughs> that's their tagline. Athleisure. <laughs> Is that what their tagline? Thank God for athleisure. <laughs> oh. So hey, good. I've got some questions. Yeah, I mean, this is a uh, this is a really cool experience for me. So, uh-huh. um, I, when I you come need this at your your do we have this? Do we have this right yeah. now? Yeah. Well, you have a podcast. You do a we short do. podcast, right? Yeah, we do Monday something. through Friday. Every day. The one thing I appreciate about about Tommy is that he's the one guy that puts it all out there. You really do as best as you can live your life very transparently well sometimes she gets pissed off about that so yesterday we went for a walk yeah and i like to capture all these moments we Mm -hmm. took her her son and the the dog out hey her dog and i like to capture these things but Mm -hmm. she's sitting there why didn't bring my phone well i like to do this because that's that's what i do i put everything out there yeah Mm -hmm. but i've got some questions whenever whenever i come somewhere i really I'm a learner. Yeah. And um, I want to know why you're interested in so many things outside of your vertical. You're a drummer. Right. There's a lot of depth to you. There's some. There's other things that you want to accomplish. Is that common? Are most drummers, are they only drummers? Do they Do they have the – I look at you as someone that's trying to get more horizontal to do more things. Yeah. 
Um, and that's why I, that's why I'm, we're, I think we're kind of a, yeah. attracted to each other yeah. and while we're in love, maybe. Mm. That's right. I, I, you know, Jim Jim really understands me because he's kind of been my spirit whisperer, my muse for about 11, almost 12 years. Um, but, you know, you work your entire life. When I was a child, I had such a laser focus. I said, I am going to be a drummer. I am going to tour the world. I'm going to travel the world on someone else's dime. I'm going to hear myself on the radio. I'm going to see myself on television. And it took so long to do that. And I, it took forever even just to get the tools in my toolbox. By the time I got out with my master's degree in music, I was 26 years old. Mm -hmm. So I moved here and I had to start all over. And you're crashing parties and you're shaking hands and you're playing for free. And that was, you know, 24 years ago. I've always been interested in utilizing my personality in other ways. I, I've seen every episode of Three's Company, and I thought to myself, oh my God, I don't have to be Jack Tripper. I could be Larry. I could be the guy that comes in, Jack, can I borrow $20? There's this hot blonde. I was like, I don't have to carry the whole series. I can just be part of it. And so I started going down that path and doing fun things like this. I don't know. It's just another way to showcase my personality. Well, what mm. is it like to be famous? Well, I'm not famous, but you're, you're I bring... Kind of, you're, you're close to being famous. I I have notoriety in my field, but I you'll never see me in People Magazine in my current job. No, but you've got... Um, you're one step from fame, and you can introduce yourself as Jason Aldean's drummer, right. and you're going to probably be accepted. Have you ever mm. been to the Playboy Mansion? Oh, yeah. You have? Oh, yeah. What's that like? <laughs> How did you, how'd you get there? It's, you get a, the it's a lot smaller than you would think. So I saw the grotto. I swam into the grotto. And I had, you know, there's the little bunnies walking around serving shrimp and stuff. Is there always nudity there? <clears throat> I saw the monkeys. That was really the, my favorite part. He had a monkey cage. Oh. Now, yeah. how, did, how did you get an invite there? I teach at, sometimes at the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, where is where these corporate types go. And they pay, you know, a nice fee to go play with the guys from Night Ranger or Ronnie James' Dio's band, right? And then I'm, I was like a camp counselor. And then they had the, the end of the festivities at the Playboy Mansion. So I got to see it. It was great. Did you get to meet Hugh? I didn't see Hugh. He was probably either in his bedroom, you know, upstairs, locked away, mm -hmm. or, you know, he was off doing some... <clears throat> something in Fiji or something with that kind of money. So the house is not that big? It really isn't. It's just uh, got a lot of uh, history. Mm -hmm. And if those walls could talk. Wow. Talk about a write-off. What yeah. a tax write-off that house is. You're right. You know, that's a, that's the primary purpose of it is uh, to do exactly that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Rent it out. And, oh, by the way, I can live in it. I mean, years ago, he used to have Playboy clubs. They were in Chicago. Like, they yeah. were a chain. And yeah. the comedians like Leno worked there and mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of famous cabaret right singers. I was thinking about it. The extortion that guy can do. <laughs> Damn. Think about all the things he's seen. I just but don't. he's so well respected in the industry that I, I ain't think... talking about him. I'm talking about the guest. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you probably could. Very politicians. Oh, yeah. Actors. Well, you know, we're here to shed light on your business, but you said- But you this had, is an interesting conversation. Well, you just letting it happen. Well, he had multiple Real questions. Real estate's so yeah. boring. Well, we're, but, gonna, we're doing our best to make it sexy. You're, you're know, kind of I like a, a celebrity, local celebrity well, here I, in I, real estate. I, I really look at myself like like this guy, like that pretty guy right there. I mean, 150 has, homes a year, that's not incredible. Not to scoff at. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's good. It's definitely, I'm probably a top 35 or 40 agent in the Nashville area out nice. of 10,000. But um, but you always but, were in, in real estate. When did it really start taking a turn and pivoting for now you? Now, we can get into some painful shit there. I'm talking yeah. about that. I mean, I, I just get more talking about real estate. I, I really love how you have taken your vertical as a drummer and you're building out a brand. But let me tell you what happened to me. <laughs> At 35 years old, the that was 2008, 2009 when the recession hit. Mm -hmm. And I was a guy that was very good at probably order taking or building relationships. And if everything went okay, they I could sell a house. But I was not a business person. I did not know really the mechanics of selling. So I moved in with my mama at 35 years old. I went through a terrible breakup. She could cook. I don't know if she even cooked. I, I was eating. <laughs> I was uh, going to my friend's house and eating a lot during that time to get out of my mom's house. But uh, at that time, it was the worst thing that had ever happened to me. But it was the first time that I really had to embrace true pain with myself. 
Other times, I could find a way to wiggle out before it got too tough. Mm -hmm. But this is the one time, finally, at 35, where you kind of hit that rock bottom and you're forced to feel failure, forced to feel letting you down, your friends down. And the only way that I could overcome that was years of self-improvement, self-development, where I got into a coaching program and I started building myself from, from the inside, internally working on confidence skill set of, of selling and at the time is the worst thing that ever happened to me but it's it was by far the one thing that changed my life mm -hmm. and and whenever i started going through this i started to get better and um that me getting better and then getting recognized by people that saw what i hey man you're you're, you're starting to do things different that kind of fueled my purpose because I'm an only child that loves attention, and I was starting to finally, for once in my life, to get attention for doing cool shit. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, instead of dicking off in class. Yeah. But I was getting attention by accomplishing things, and it was kind of like a little snowball that just kept building momentum. And today, man, I'm on fire about that. This kind of stuff. You know, yeah. it's taking. Was Coach Burt your first coach? He was. He was the. He was the one person. Him and Grant Cardone were the two people that really just kind of forced me. To, um, you know, I'm not a believer of motivation because it doesn't last, but it was really the first time that I looked at myself and I wanted to accomplish more. And the reason why I remember it like it was yesterday, I was listening to Bert interview Cardone, and Cardone said, Man, success is your duty, your obligation. And if it's not for you, it's for your mom. And I was sitting there thinking, Dude, I'm 38 years old living with my mom. How does she really feel about me? I know she loves me. But she's got to be somewhat disappointed in me. And and I started crying. You know, I started crying in the car because I wanted more for me, for my mom, for my mom to be proud of. You know, I'm an, I'm an only child, and a lot of things probably didn't go the way she wanted it in her life. And I felt like, you know, I, the one thing I can do is give this gift to my mom. So that's that's been a huge um, – Motivator. Yeah, it's been a huge purpose for me is yeah. to, hey, I, wanna, I don't want her to – to feel disappointed, I want her to be proud of me. I'm sure she is. Yeah, of course but she is. We had you had to hit that crossroads. It was like, it was it was pleasure and pain at the same time. It became pleasurable. It turned into that. I think once you become 25 years old, you've got to learn through pain. Mm -hmm. I think you've kind of been beat up enough, and you start to give up, and your friends start to give up, and your circles are given up, and it took me a really painful experience to um, to to really dig in and work on me because I, I really was lazy and I was selfish. Well, you know, I, I got married and divorced at 25 and 26. Had, so did I. Had to we're, reinvent myself. We're just alike. And then <laughs> I didn't make really any money to speak of until I was maybe around 34 years old. When I was 34, I heard myself on the radio for the first time. I was in a band called Rushlow, and I was driving down I-65 with my bandmates, and we heard ourselves on the radio, and that was one of our life's goals. So we all started, you know, three grown men bawling, like crying because our dreams had come to fruition. And I'm a late bloomer because usually at about 35 years old, you know, you, you're on your path. Maybe you have 10 years of earnings. Uh, maybe you're buying your second home or something. It's different for everyone. But for me, I didn't even get going with Aldine until I was 34, 35 years old. Total late bloomer. And now I'm staring at 50, looking back at kind of like a body you of work. You look good at you know? 50, though. Oh, man, I'll take it. I'd it's trade my age for years if I could look like you. Oh, <laughs> you know what's really funny? That's Baby, more, who's better you. looking, me or him? Oh, stop. Oh, geez. She, I'm not even she, included she, in she the did, equation here, well, for crying out loud. What's hey. up with that? <laughs> Let's put him in there. I know. She didn't mean that, Rich. She really meant you. Well, <laughs> we <laughs> we had a celebrity stylist on the on the show, and we were talking about Jim's branded <laughs> shirts, and because he has a uniform, he wears it every day. It serves two purposes. He doesn't have to think about it. He puts it on. He's advertising his business. People are like JMVO. What's that? It's a conversation starter. Yeah. Okay. Right? Now, Jim is sending me secret messages on Facebook Messenger, and he said, tell the story about your grandmother. You remember that? Where that was one of the things that stuck out, and your parents told me the story on yeah. that world-class documentary. Yeah, Jim did create a documentary 10 years ago. Um, Roughly. Called, 
Working the Dream. It's on YouTube, and it's basically the, the, the climb in the early Aldine days. Well, it was a week in the life of a working Nashville musician. Yes. And that's the way we positioned it. But one of the things your parents had pointed out was how your grandmother said, yeah, that's all well and good what you're doing, but when are you going to go get a real job? Oh, my God. That really <laughs> hurt, guys. Wow. But then I showed her, and it turned into... <laughs> nope. Yeah. Still learning the sound effect button. That's here. good. But yeah. I mean. It's turning into that because you're becoming a comedic actor. Well, I'm working on what it. What are you, you I didn't, are you acting? Do you have something? Yeah. I do. I've been studying for so four years. So we need years. to get back to your grandmother first. You <laughs> oh, know, yes. Do you want to go into this? Let's talk to my grandma. My grandmother, Ida Paradiso. Now, she was a good cook. Oh, my God. Is that God. Italian? What is that's totally a tell. Totally. Paradiso. 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 And she was married to Pasquale Paradiso. And in America, you call it Pasquale Pat. So he was Pat Paradiso. And he had it so good because my grandmother was such an amazing cook. And she was responsible for me being a fat little eight-year-old kid. She'd be like, Richie, come on in. I have a Portuguese roll with butter. And then she, I, and I would snack on that just to tide me over to dinner. Were you a little fat, Richie? A lot of carbs. No, I was just kid? a little pudgier. Okay. You know what I mean? And then you figure it out. you like, oh, I can't eat bread every day. You know, like Oprah. I love bread. <laughs> there we um, go. So anyways, my, I, I was on the Donnie and Marie show and I was on Austin City Limits with this girl named Susan Ashton. She was like uh, this award-winning contemporary Christian artist and she was trying to cross over to the country market. So here I go to sunny Los Angeles. I'm playing all these television shows. I said, Graham, I'm on the Donnie and Marie show. Donnie and Marie and Austin City Limits. She's like, yeah, that's fine, Richie, but when are you going to get a real job? Because I was the only person in generations of our family to do something in the creative arts. And it, for her, it was just like, you know, I have- It's a hobby. Yeah, it's a hobby. Mm -hmm. So anyways, that really fueled me. I was like, I'll show her, mm -hmm. you know, and she, I think to, she's passed, but she'd be really proud of me. So you just got to follow your purpose mm -hmm. no matter what. And people will laugh and there will be negative Nellies and there'll be doors that are slammed in your face and there'll be roadblocks and speed bumps and you just have to persist. Well, that, that inspires me. Who could you think of in your business that maybe it took them forever to get to where they are like mm. i don't know how quick it some of these singers it seems like they're 20 years old and they they've already made it but who is someone that that you've been around and maybe you didn't even think they could make it maybe you didn't think they had the talent but they persevered and they hung in there and they fought and now let's say they're you know there's somebody mm -hmm. that, that, that's what inspires me whenever yeah. we're talking about rocky and i'm seeing this underdog guy who just out of nowhere gets a chance to fight apollo creed and he comes so close to beating him. See, I, I think of myself as an underdog because yeah. I'm 35 years old, living with my mom, and I had to fight through all that stuff. But well, I get the real. The, I get really inspired about hearing people. But think. what was the turning point? So you're living with her at 35, and your self development, learning I'm, your sales techniques, and what your purpose in life is, and your confidence is growing. Well, uh, the turning point was. Um, it was really going to work on on my the internal confidence side of me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really, at the time, was probably more promoted throughout life because I was funny or I was hanging out with certain people. But you earned your nickname. I earned my nickname. Right. But uh, you know, the someone good, else gave you that nickname, right? Yes, my friends used to call me Good Time Tommy. Like if I'd get real drunk and my mm. my clothes would start to my collar would come up and I just do <laughs> stupid things. But I could see that. But uh, I, I did earn my nickname, but it started, when people started taking me serious as a salesperson, that little bit of confidence that I felt, it was it was kind of like um, some type of energy. You know, mm -hmm. I just like, man, I, I, I really became uh, as addicted to the improvement as kind of the fuck off side. Mm -hmm. Is that illegal to say on No, that? no. It's very fine. But, There's uh, no I FCC. Mean, uh, okay. But, but I mean, I, I really started feeling the best about myself whenever people started saying, man, you're you're going somewhere. I mean, I can see a difference. So that's what it was, and it's just something that I kept building on. And today, I mean, every morning, 5 o'clock, I'm up training. And when I'm saying training, I want to become a better salesperson. My mission is to become the best salesperson and marketer in my, in my field. I, I want to dominate that part of real estate. Well, the thing is that you talked about was the fact that you, you felt that you tasted the – Nectar. Bitter, yeah, the bittersweet 
flavor of failure, which I think is important. Not enough kids in their 20s taste that right I didn't. I didn't taste it. I mean, I drowned in it. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, it, it was it was I, embedded I was in your DNA. I was suffocated with mediocrity and failure to to a point to where it was my belief system. Mm-hmm. Right. I can't do this. I can't do that. Well, mm-hmm. you know, other people. I really believe that. And then I guess as uh, I was exposed to more personal development, mm-hmm. I started believing it. Mm-hmm. I started really thinking, well, hey, why can't I do this? Negative well, self-talk. What is, uh, yeah. was outside of Michael Burt, because you know, he does have a great program, were there other um, thought leaders or books or authors you were? Yep, yeah, Grant Cardone. Okay, yeah. Kind of looked like Grant Cardone, <laughs> doesn't he? Is there, there, there's some similarities there. We, um, when we, we interviewed, flew down there. Yeah, we flew down there and interviewed Grant on his own set for his show. And he was really fun. He was like, playing with my hair he was really messing with me he really was he was really he hazed me that day but it was good we persisted and it ended up being a good interview he could be a tough interview i mean because he's he's the personality yeah when the personality is being interviewed it's an interesting thing yeah you know and he'll be tough about it i mean to see him go uh, he just recently went head to head with uh, belfort the wolf of wall street which is very interesting to watch interesting but you know you put two you know heavyweight personalities in a room that's what you're going to get. I mean, you know, I'd love to see him on the Howard Stern show. I think he'd be like a great, great guest. Just two massive personalities clashing like that. Yeah, it's interesting because I was listening to Conan O'Brien um, on his new podcast. Conan O'Brien needs a friend. It's awesome. And he interviews Howard Stern. And it is always interesting to see a person, a massive personality like that, that is always known as being the host, being interviewed. Yeah. He, he ends up kind of taking over. You know, just because he has so much to say. He's he's one of the world-class interviewers. And what dri- I've always said, what drives him is the fact that he's got a natural curiosity that is unparalleled. For all. He, he can delve into a topic and just find the subtopics and keep on going down those rabbit holes that make it interesting. For sure. You know, which is important for an interviewer mm-hmm. in any given circumstance. So Jim and I talk about this all the time, and I think this parallel, and I talk to my students about this when I talk to, you know, up-and-coming musicians, drummers, people that want to be in the creative arts. I say, no one is going to want to work with you until they know you, like you, and trust you. And this is one of the backbones of your, I think, your personal philosophy. It's on your website, goodtimetommy.com. Talk about that. Well, I believe the way you shorten the sales cycle is by creating immediate trust. And I'm willing to have very, very deep level conversations immediately. Mm -hmm. And, and down here in the South, sometimes people are offended by it, but I'm, I'm, I'm very direct. Von Grotten, would you say I'm direct? Oh, yeah. And uh, I'm, not being, I'm not being direct to be a dick. I'm doing it to, to discover the reason. What it, why is it that you want to do this? Okay. What is it that you really want to accomplish? And I think tough questions build more trust. Mm-hmm. I also build trust. I'm very vulnerable. I'm very open. I'll tell you about um, moving with my mom. I'll tell you these things. Because I think I think people can really relate to failure more so than they can see. I don't know what it's like to play in front of 20,000 people. But you could talk to me about going broke or something like that, and we can share something. Oh, yeah. What is it like to play in front of 20,000 people, by the way? Well, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, an event. It's an experience that's definitely seeped in gratitude because when I moved to Nashville, I was parking cars waiting tables. I was a courier. I did construction. I waited tables uh, to said that. I also uh, was a substitute teacher. And that means getting up and being in front of a classroom at seven in the morning. Meanwhile, I was playing in the nightclubs until three in the morning. So getting four hours sleep and getting my briefcase and going teaching those kids, going, just hang in there, kid. Keep eating these ramen noodles. And I had my Texaco credit card and I maxed it out. I would live on like balance bars and um, ramen noodle. Which is really funny because ramen now is really expensive. It's celebrated. It's like a delicacy. I mean, you go to Los Angeles and you eat ramen. There's a bowl of ramen. It's like 20 bucks. But I was eating the high sodium version that you get in the supermarket. And a cup of noodles, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I had the eye of the tiger. I had the vision. I had the plan. I was not going to let anything stop me. And... I knew that by just being a drummer, we're only as good as the people we surround ourselves, our team, being in a band. I needed to find my John Mellencamp, my Elton John, my Sting, my Billy Joel, and I found that guy and a young Jason Aldean, and that was in 1999. 
And so we were able to kind of build this thing together by the sweat of our brow. How, how many years were you doing this before you met him? I started in 1976. And then I went pro in 1988. Okay, so my business is very similar. Most real estate agents are out of business within a year or two. Now, why is that? Because of how hard it is, or they can't fight through what you did. There's parallels here between us. Mm-hmm. Oh, big time. You you uh, starved yourself. You did other things to make this dream happen. Sure. And the most important thing you probably did is not give up, because there was probably times where people that you really liked thought, damn, he needs to just needs to give up he's never going to make it but you never you never believed that same thing in my industry i mean if you can probably make it through three or four or five years it's a lot easier to be successful than it is to barely get by and the funny thing is that's the quick route okay because you met aldine in 99 yeah hicktown hit in 2005 right yep that's six years 2004 that's a long time yeah okay to someone who's in their 30s or even in their 20s that's a lifetime well, there's also factors in life that play into sometimes blocking people from their creative dreams. And it, and it usually has something to do with like, maybe they marry too young and then they have a lot of children and then they have to feed those children. And then, then the focus becomes, oh my God, I have to feed these children and I can't do it by doing my the skill set that I am developing that I love, that I am passionate about. I'm going to have to go do this other thing. So lucky for me, I always believed in in condoms you know so or pulling out yeah <laughs> or anal or just flipper oh my god <laughs> oral i'm in oral. Uh, oral oh my god <laughs> that needs three that, that, that's, you know a, you know what's a three funny? stinger you know uh when i was i was always scared of having a kid mm-hmm. like in high school right a girl want to have sex hell no i mean i was scared to death of it yeah did I ever tell you my story about that? Oh, no, let's talk about this. Where did Dude, you lose your virginity? My Tim? first time. <laughs> right? I was 15 years old. And the the moment I met her, I knew. I'm like, oh, you're going to be the one. Yeah. And I was uh, 15, too. That's a good age. Yeah. So it happened. And, you know, I was, let's just say I moved on. And she didn't. And she uh, told her friends, which got back to me, that uh, I had gotten her pregnant. I'm like, you got to be flipping my first. Really? The first one. I get really. Wow. No, but that was, it was false. Oh, it was totally false. Yeah, yeah. It didn't happen. But talk about, you know, mind effing me. Yeah. Yeah. At 15 years old. How am I going to tell my parents this? You know, it's. I, it has, I would have I been a grandfather by now. It has to be like chasing heroin. You know, that it, you never get the. <laughs> The first time. What is it like? Because when you get that, that, when you get that first time, it is like a warm apple pie. It really is. It's just yeah. like wow. Thank you, God. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then, and then you realize it lasts like four seconds, yeah, and then you're, so you're kind of like, and and she's sitting there, kind of like, really? Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, I, I got to work on that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I know. you know, and eventually you get better at it. Reload like anything time. Else. Yeah. Hey, you're giving her ideas over there. I'm yeah. 46 now. I mean, right. now yeah. I'm on the opposite end of that. Mm-hmm. Like, damn, do I have to do this? <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's right. a joke. It's a joke. But you know, the thing about about sex is that it's like Chinese food. It's not over until everyone gets their cookies. Yeah. That, that's the important thing in if a marriage. If you're a considerate lover. Right. You have to be. Totally. Right? You, you got to figure out ways to keep on going and like, for you know, Sometimes it takes a little longer, right? And then obviously, you know, you got to basically, I always envisioned landing a plane, like to kind of, you know, stave it off if you get my drift. Oh, yeah. Right, I mean? Yeah. So I would just sit there because at the time I got really into like flight simulators and everything. So I'd imagine landing a plane. Huh. Or, or, or I would think of um, a Bill Gates novel. Wow. Yeah. That's, I don't usually think of like giant fat people. That's another yeah. way to do it too. <laughs> Yeah, but if all of a we'll sudden probably I, edit all if this I, out, if I, no, not at all. We're keeping this. <laughs> if I ever get in the mode where I'm just, you know, like in the moment, and I'm going, oh, it, yeah, yeah, done, and that plane. That's right. Hey, so <laughs> you're a good looking dude. You're running a lot of. Thank you. <laughs> are you talking to him? You too. You too. Okay. <laughs> Jim, you the are. only difference is he's around twenty thousand people. That's right. So whenever I mean, how often do what is it like in the movies? I mean, if you wanted to get laid. After every show, could you do it? 
Um, not anymore. Well, if you weren't in a relationship. Not with the Me Too thing, probably. No, it's just that, um, you know, the larger the musical act gets, the more layers of, of like security and separation there is. So like the culture of our band is everyone in the band now is married with children and there's just <laughs> layers and layers of security t- to actually get from the crowd to where we are. If you could have been a musician in any decade, which one? The 70s, 1969 to 1981. Why did you say, look at Tommy taking control of the interview? I would love to be a teenager in the 70s because why? We're coming out of free love and some of the greatest music ever created was from 1969 to 1981. So like this is like post Beatles all the way through classic rock. So you got the Stones, you got the Who, you got the Beatles, you got Zeppelin, you got the Mamas and the Papas, you got Hendrix, all that music that I celebrate was happening during that period. And then then New Wave came and then that's when I got into music. I, I fell in love with Martha Quinn on MTV and the Synchronicity record came out from the police in 1983. And that's when I said, this is what I'm going to do. But to be a teenager in the 70s, the greatest music well, and culture. What would it have been like just, to have been on the road in the 70s oh, where I, people oh, didn't know what you're doing? Yeah. And, I mean... That's why we had, you know, the AIDS epidemic in the 80s. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's what happened. Yeah. But, I mean, the 80s was, I mean, there are people now living that would love to have been a teenager in the 80s like I like we were. Kids you know? today, I don't, I, it's a tough world for them, man. You know, imagine growing up, we use social media as a tool. Like, you know, people, a lot of my peers are like, oh my God, Redmond too much on the social media, you know, but, and there's people that use it even way more than me. You know, the Grant Cardones and the Gary V's of the world. I don't have a lot of secrets. Much of my life, I, I put it out there. I share things with people. Here I, here I am. This is where I am in the world. This is where I'm going. Look at my breakfast. I put an avocado on my cereal. Like, you know, just stuff like that. There's like not a lot of privacy left. Can you imagine being a kid growing up and trying to figure things out all on public display? Like, oh, they didn't like me or I only got 20 likes. Right. Yesterday I got 40. That's got to be weird, right? Yeah. One of the things that I sell by is something that actually Jimmy over there, JMVO, taught me, Dem-centric. It's a concept mm. that he'll, he'll probably break down for me, but yeah. everything that I do, I think, what what would people get out of this? Mm-hmm. And explain that. Yeah, Jim. Um, that is basically goes back to my radio days of teaching clients – that came in that wanted to beat their chest and do nothing but eviscerate themselves on their commercials because, hey, I'm paying for it and I have a captive audience. Well, no, you don't. And that captive audience isn't very good if they're not listening to what you have to say. So if you connect with the heart and you give them something of value, they're going to be more receptive and salient to what you have to say. So even on social media, I even put up a, uh, a post the other day that said, um, Nobody nobody cares about your posts, about your content, until you make them care about your content. Mm-hmm. Okay? You have to find ways to make them care about it. Right. And just by putting it out there and expecting stuff in return. Now, some people can do that. They're just because of who they are. They have a fan base and everything. But until you get to that level, you've got to deliver something of value. Even when you're you're following up in a sales uh, process, I always tell it's it's a value-based follow-up. Instead of saying... I'm following up, I'm touching base, I'm you know hitting you back. What have you got for me now? Okay, if every time my phone rings and your name comes up, I don't want you to do, oh gosh. Wonder what, what that guy What wants. does he want now? Okay. I know I what want, he wants. I know, <laughs> right. I mean, basically if I get a phone call from somebody or if I call somebody, I want them to look at my name and go, oh, he's probably got something for me. That's my end goal. Mm-hmm. Same thing with your social media. Yeah. If every time you post on social media, it's going to be something that is advertising, it, it's got to have value. I, I've definitely had uh, been guilty of being a promosexual is what a lot of my colleagues call what me. What does a, that mean? I'm a promosexual. So always a lot of promos going on because I've created products. I've written two books. I have sticks. I have um, beaters. I have cases. I have programs and camps. And so it, unless you're a celebrity that has a team of people that is doing things on your behalf and they know it's that, I have to sell my wares. You know, almost like I'm not a snake oil salesman because everything I do, do is from the sweat 
out of my brow. But that's why I try to mix in things that are of value for, I guess for my, my client base would be, there's a lot of drummers that are interested in like, how can I do what you're doing? So I, in the bottom of all my Instagram posts, I say, DM me for a same day response, right? So anybody can DM me um, and I answer every one of them. Every and, and a lot of things are coming in. They're coming in via text. They're coming in via email. They're coming in through instant messenger. They're coming in through DMs, Twitter direct messages. Oh, yeah. Like it's a, and people expect to have that stuff returned to them same day or next day. I got a question. Yeah. Because again, I'm in one vertical real estate compared mm -hmm. to your one vertical of being a drummer for Jason Aldean. Right. I'm in a, I'm in a part of my life where I want to create more products. How did you come up with the idea? Is somebody else that's a drummer, are they are they doing a product line, or did you just come up with this idea? Because I, I have found it's very challenging to create products that people will buy. Is the purpose to sell them and make money? Is the purpose to build your brand? Why? Why? Tell me why you did products and how it works for you, how it helps you. Jim might have a good insight, like the, the 50,000 foot view. But I mean, for me, it was like, we're in a day where you can self publish books on amazon.com in a physical format and a digital format. You could record your own version for audible. Um, I think it's every drummer's dream to have their own signature stick. And then you start thinking about cases or beaters. And it's just basically, it all comes down to relationships. So when I talk about my crash concept, which is an acronym for commitment, relationships, attitude, skill, and hunger. One of the biggest takeaways is relationships. And most of the people that I have encountered in my life and developed friendships with, I mixed business and pleasure with. I made a business model out of mixing business and pleasure. Why, why did you write this book? Well, I wrote the book because I'm still, um, I feel like I'm too young for a memoir. But this book is like half memoir and half um, self-help. Which is how we designed it. Yeah. yeah. So the idea is like, what? what's a quick, what are five things that people can use to live a more successful life? And they can get on a Southwest flight from, you know, Dallas to Los Angeles and read the entire book. Well, Jim, I think we've got a lot of friends that everything they do has to make sense financially. If the book does not make you money, is it still a win for you? Yes, it's a it's a modern day business card because you're definitely, unless you're Stephen King, you're not going to get rich from selling books. You're just not, you know? And I, I mean, unless you just have a huge audience fan base and you're doing your funnels and doing all that stuff, it's, I, I, I mean, if I was going to, I would have to sell millions of copies to get rich on this thing. You know, so it's just a way of when you do your speaking events, you it's a wonderful way to leave a little takeaway so people could be reminded of the experience that you I had. think it's the legitimacy for yeah. the uh, speaking events. Also, yeah, every, every, everybody is like, you have to write a book to be taken seriously and as a speaker. I, I agree with that. I've got some more questions. Because, <laughs> I'm I love this format. I know. Uh, I, well, I mean, I'm the easiest very, show I'm, we've ever done. I'm, yeah. I'm very interested in you guys, but yeah. You know, we we were talking about my production. I think this year I'll probably sell 165 houses. Good for you. Congrats. Well, our, our team. God bless. Our my team. Big time. But um, tell me, uh, when did things, because I'm still looking for that moment to where, like, man, things are going good. When did that happen for you? Um, Let's see. It depends on your definition of success, yeah. right? So I was. Well, my, my, my definition has with age gotten bigger. I want me and Brittany to have a, a, a house in Florida. Yeah. There's things that I, that, that I want. Maybe she wants it. I don't know. As long as there's a palm tree. Well, there's just things I think a lot bigger than I used to. And because of how big I think, I'm disappointed a lot more often than I used to be. But I want to know, when when did you feel like, man, I kind of hit what uh, that sweet spot that I've always wanted? Well, if you shoot for the moon, right, and you only hit like a, uh, that – third layer of clouds up there it's pretty mm -hmm. good still right yeah, shoot from the land on the roof yeah that old thing when i started making money playing the drums after i got my master's degree moved into dallas texas and i was playing on jingles and i was teaching and i was in the best top 40 band in town and i was playing a lot of, i was making a living playing music and i was killing myself working like 350 days a year to maybe make thirty thousand dollars so i said to myself okay this is great and i'm moving towards my goal but my ultimate goal was to hear myself on the radio see myself on television and travel the world that wasn't going to help that happen in dallas texas so i had to take a step back to take a step forward which meant moving to new york 
York, Los Angeles, or Nashville. So I moved to Nashville, starved, and then my first marquee job was with a girl with with a lady named Pam Tillis in 1999. And that was the first time I had a salary and somebody was setting up my drums and I got to be on a tour bus. So that would have been the first real victory of swimming in the waters that I wanted to swim in. And I've just kept moving forward since then. Again, another parallel, you're in a commoditized industry where there are how many drummers are in Nashville? Oh, it's, it, it used to be called Guitar Town. Uh, Steve Earle had a famous record called Guitar Town. And I think it's for the last 20 years has been Drum Town because all the kids that are going to Berkeley, University of Miami, Musicians Institute, they're not moving to New York and LA anymore. They're moving to Nashville because you can own property here. It's more reasonable to be able to, to buy to have dirt under your feet, you know, uh, lifestyle wise. I tell my students all the time, spend one long weekend in New York, one long weekend in Los Angeles and one long weekend in Nashville because you're going to have to live there. You're going to be part of the culture, mm -hmm. you know, in Los Angeles, a fixer upper in North Hollywood is $600,000. And then you have to put another hundred thousand dollar in to bring it up to date. So here, Just up the code, you know, here, uh, that I guess, Three hundred thousand dollars, right? You're you're yeah. got a nice little house, right? Even two seventy five, something like that. But my parallel is I'm in a commoditized industry. There's ten thousand agents around here. Right. What what do I do to get to to number one? You Put know? the heart in there. Yeah, that's well, that is part of it. But yeah. there's a lot more that goes into it. But I mean, it's perseverance, it's strategy, it's skill, relationships, right. getting known. Getting known, it's all mm -hmm. these things. But I mean, there's a lot of, I can draw a lot of similarities between what, what I were, you're where I'd want to be. I, I would want to be on that level. And in my, in, in my market, Gary Ashton, for example, he's the top agent in this town. And he probably wow. sells 1,500 homes. Oh my God. He's probably the number one team in the world. So do you have a team? I do. I do. But Gary Ashton probably has 150 people. But how long has he been at it? Probably about the same time. He's really? just, yeah, I mean, he's just brilliant that, uh, you know, I look at it like this. Just because I say he's great has nothing to do with me. You know, he can be great and I can be great. But it just so happens he's But what did he do times, that was different? Uh, he's, he's understood how to scale. I don't know if he, I don't understand. I don't know about his profitability, but he sells 1,500 homes in a year. 1,500. Huh. Wow. That is, I mean, it's he's one of the top people in the world. Wow. At what he does, there's there's a way of doing it, you know, and and uh, I do a lot with Monty Moore, you know, who was a, a great friend of mine and has been since 2011 or so, and uh, he's building a team as well, and and there are so many different ways you can do it, you know. Gary Ashton, I feel like probably did maybe like the Walmartization of scale, where you know he attracted people by price, he led with price, but there's so many other ways. I mean, you can you can have the key of the Hyundai of what you do but then you can get the boutique aspect of it and do the mercedes bmw porsche so there's there's so many different ways of going about it the voiceover industry is doing those same going through the same shifts okay a lot of creative industries are going through that oh, we're totally being, being commoditized disrupted yeah and there are people that are within the industry getting upset about the newbies coming on board, getting on Fiverr, doing a read for 15 or 20 dollars or 25 dollars but i'm like guys that's that's the reality. I know, but that you're, you not a, you're not with. a fifteen or twenty dollar voiceover guy. But you know what? If if I can get it on volume, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do a, re, a rip and read. You know, the other day I, I read a uh, script for. It but is it ever minutes. a rip and read, or do they want? No, that's it. It seems like do you guys? But that's where the sales process comes in, where I'm able to give them the value and the value proposition, and say, understand that if I do this, I'm going to try. I'm going to try and upsell you. Right. A lot of creatives get very uh, skittish and they don't want to do that. So but whether you're a drummer, photographer, videographer, voiceover talent, whatever, or musician, there's a sales aspect that's lacking. And that's what's not being talked about. And I guess that's kind of what I own. It's also not being taught in academic institutions. Oh, absolutely. They teach you, you know, how to catch a fish, but not how to do it for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. They teach you, yeah, how to, uh, yeah, how to get a fish or whatever. Yeah, I don't know what the old adage is. Well, just they just teach you the skill, but not how to build a business so you can put the skill to work for the they rest of your life. They also are teaching you the same way from fifty years ago. Oh yeah, you know, it's just. Mm -hmm. I've got a question. Yeah, I, I know. No, I ask. We need a drum questions. roll we do. thing. I, I know. If uh, have you ever seen Top Gun? Yes, no, the yeah. next one's coming out. Whenever is it? The prequel, a sequel, or a remake? 
sequel. No, it's a uh, sequel. He's wow. older. He's Maverick. Gotcha. Yeah. But remember when Iceman asked him, are you having trouble figuring it out, who the best pilot is? Mm-hmm. Can you figure out, like if you're in a room with a top drummer, can you tell who the best drummer is? Well, best is... It's so subjective. Yeah, and because yeah. is it the fastest? Is it the guy with the most drums? Is it the guy with the highest paying job? Is it the guy that's played on more? No, I'm talking about if you were just looking at this person's skill, this person's skill. Yeah. Could we have a drum contest? I think or? well, there's a lot of drum contests, but I don't. Uh, a lot of it is based on flash, showmanship, and speed. Where would you rank yourself? I'm a. I'm just a, between us. I'm a song drummer. So what Nashville taught me was how to honor a song because we're in the songwriting capital of the yeah. world and play musically and make singer songwriters bands artists producers happy so that is not going to come from speed or flash honor the song that's a great term yeah i'm going to steal that that's called that's another aspect of being them centric mm-hmm. okay yeah. he's not there for him he's there to serve the song first and foremost and then the artist, mm-hmm. and then I would assume the uh, the guy producing the record. And also the, the audience, the little bit of the flash comes in there because most people don't know anything about the specifics of music, music. So they hear with their eyes. And so that's when I go up there and make sure that I'm presenting myself in my best version of myself. They hear with their eyes. They hear with their eyes. See, that's what I'm talking about today, Von Grafton, on these videos. It ain't, it's... Stuff with the eyes. Like Kiss? <laughs> like Kiss was like, let's dress like demons and aliens and monsters and cats, and then we're going to spit blood. There's going to be fire and pyrotechnics on stage. People are going to love it. They yeah. thought they were crazy, and now they're like in their fourth decade of still doing this. They can do it as long as they want. It was a gimmick. Yeah, but yeah. they but they changed the rules. Yeah, they did. They, well, they forged their own bath. Yeah. Yeah. And they became kind of their own their own gimmick, uh, gimmick esque type of way Gene, of doing it. I mean, Gene Simmons is a marketing guy, yeah. Yeah. and he's a comic book guy yeah. who happens to play the bass. Yeah, he combined all three. Right. And the thing about you is the fact that you are so authentic. That's gonna. Be, I've always said since I met you that that's gonna lead your your path. Nobody's being as authentic as you are. Do you have a number in mind to hit each year? Because because well, some of your websites say that you sell over a hundred homes a year, right? Now you're at the one sixty five. One sixty five. I think that number's always going to change, mm-hmm. but um, I want to become the number one agent in in my town. <clears throat> it's going to be tough. Because Murfreesboro in Murfreesboro, but yeah. some of these guys they can just keep adding so many people to their. To their team, but if there if there's a number today, three hundred units, mm-hmm. I'd like to get to that, but yeah. I'm sure it's going to change. Sure, but but again, what I enjoy the most about what I do is the development of mm-hmm. the team of me, and I love whenever somebody else on our team gets a sale because I helped them get the sale. That's that probably makes me feel better than than um, me selling it because. If someone works for me and they have a money problem, that means I've got a money problem because I can't get to the level that I want to without them. And now, more people like When them. you say your team, is it your team and these people report to you or you're all on this John C. Jones real estate? How does that work? I- no, it's at John Jones real estate. John's got his side of the building, which mm-hmm. is about 21 people. Then I've got my own side that's about, I don't know, nine people now. Right. And I need to get it up to 25 people. Mm-hmm. But so I, these 25 people, potential employees, team members. In, in our world, you're independent contractors. And so know, do so. you make, when they go to sell, they're under you. Do you take a taste of their taste? We call it, we tax it like in the mafia. Yeah. You're a good earner. You That's know, right. your family was your family yeah. in the mob. You're they, they, they're your capos. I have one people, one guy in the mob in my, in my well, family. Well, uh, <laughs> so you know how it works. I mean, <laughs> yeah. uh, if he sells something, I get a taste of his I ass. It. Come on. <laughs> hey, can we talk about the Vegas thing, or is that something that you don't talk about? You know, I had my band in here, uh, Curtin and uh Kurt and Tully I've been playing music with them for 24 years we don't really talk about it publicly just because it was something that was uh, tragic that happened and we all recovered in our own way and and the, the takeaway is that we're super grateful and we're just gonna keep on pursuing our purpose in life and which is one of those things is to entertain people and well, change lives so well can I ask you this it's not directly about that but it's because of it one of the things I talk a lot about with my people is fear 
And you would be amazed at how many people are scared to call. Did you have a fear to keep moving forward? You mean cold calls? No, was singing or on the stage. Oh, oh you mean I, he's talking about people making calls on yeah. his team? Fear so, of, yeah, well, I talk about fear. People are scared to do things. And I was mm-hmm. just wondering, did you have a fear after that event to, to go out? And, um, I think because, let's see. It happened on a Sunday, and by the f- Thursday, I was in New York City, and we did Saturday Night Live, which was a very... You've done Saturday Night Live? We did that. It was... Um, uh, it was uh, Tom Petty. It was in, in in parallel with Tom Petty's death. Yeah. Huh. And you play Won't Back Down. It was it was a, it was a, a, a very healing thing for America. <laughs> Oops. No All worries. Right. Damn. Hey, hey that's what gonna, we do. Hey, we play that percussion. That cost us. <laughs> that's percussion, baby. Percussion is anything you rub, <laughs> rattle, shake, or scrape, and that's what's happening in my studio right now. Um, but no, now we're back. You know, you know, my purpose in life is to is to is to change lives and affect people in a positive way, and I can do that. That's my mantra. That's my why. That's mm-hmm. why. That's my start with why. So everything I do can fall under that that thing. So so after being filled with with um, faith, family, friends, passion, and purpose, I can continue on doing what we do. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's a that's a good answer to that. I mean, it's uh, fear; it's all in the mind. Yeah, I mean, what happens between uh, between our ears? What is what either enables us or stops us? It, yeah. Well, that's that's one of the things I focus on because mm-hmm. fear held me back. I grew up with a, a grandmother who taught. Who told me to be scared of everything? Yeah, and I don't think we really understand how we, much. that generation did that. I mean, yeah, they had a lot to be afraid of because they, our parents came out of the gen. They were being told by their parents who were of the depression right. era. That's okay, right. so everything that back then was more about practicality. Uh, college was, be- was becoming more of an institution and being foisted upon that if you wanted to be have an edge, you had to go to college. I mean, when I went to high school. College was something that was put to me that you either do it or you be, you're going to be a loser. Mm-hmm. Okay, those were the two options you had. That mindset, uh, yeah. handicapped you for a while. Oh my gosh, right. it was huge. I held it massively against myself, and until I became a full time entrepreneur, you know, of several years ago. Well, actually, when I got into radio, was when I became a lot more confident in my abilities. Okay, my first confidence really started to reveal itself when I started getting when I started playing the drums. It was my first purpose and identity for me. So that really led to other things creatively. You know, I wanted to chase money at some point and get in, you know, I was actually going to go down the road of being an electrician of all things. It just wasn't me. I had to do my thing and get it out of my system. Okay. But that fear of jumping out and doing my own thing when I was in my early days of Vegas, uh, Vegas radio, I had opportunities to go, well, I can do this on my own. It wasn't time yet. Right. I had a lot more stuff to learn, you know. Then I got out of radio and went into the car business, and and that still that transition. There was a notion where I had in my head, I could do this on my own. But my wife and I, you know, I've got responsibilities and obligations that had to be scary. Yeah, we were just coming off the 08 recession, which was still fresh in everybody's mind, mm-hmm. and nobody knew what the next year was going to bring. Um, but it was one of those things that you really just kind of, you, you eventually you just got to take the leap, yeah. you know? And when it comes to your team making phone calls, guys, just figure out what you're going to bring to this person. Mm-hmm. What's the value proposition? What are you going to bring to them? How are you bearing gifts? Right. Okay. If you know that they're looking for a house of a certain square footage in a certain area and has certain Schools. amenities, right? Always have have an option for them. What's come on the market today that I can bring to my customer? Same thing in the car business. If I knew they were looking for a two seater roadster that was a hard top, and one of our stores, I would constantly scour our stores. We had over a hundred stores to scour from, and I'd be like, "Hey, do, how is how are the kids? How's everybody? You doing okay? What's up?" Yeah, I'm calling the check on you first and foremost. How are you? I always feel you like, ever ask anybody yeah. genuinely how are you and be genuinely no, interested. No, no, you have a thought on that because you said that people don't like hearing that. But if you're inter- if you're genuinely There's interested something on your podcast where you're like when you start a call with how are you doing, it's it sounds flaccid. You're about to sell or, this. This so, is one of those things that Glenn. Um, the video guy, I can't remember his name. Yeah, yes. You remember Glenn? Yeah. He used to do that. Cold calls? No, he used to go, he used to look at me and look at me right in the eye and go, how are you? Yes, Glenn And he wanted, he wanted to know. 
Yes. You really wanted to know. If you can come across that persuasive on a phone call and want to know how that person is doing, they'll tell you. Yeah. Well, the problem with, with, with it for us is we're usually calling people we're competing against all the other people that have called them. And it's not just, you know, sure. on our way up here, I, we, we all get calls from telemarketers. Right. Yeah. And because of more all and more, the, because of all the calls we've gotten from them, we're pissed off at the next one that calls. Yeah. has nothing to do with them. That's what makes because our Because they're jobs, being done by amateurs. Well, I mean, to me, I, we, you know how you address a cold call? We'll role play right now. Okay. I'm calling you. Ring. Hello. Hey, is this Tommy? Yes, it is. Tommy, let me start off right away. This is a cold call. Nobody likes making them. Nobody likes like, likes getting them. Is it? Can we agree on that? Of course. All right. My name is Jim McCarthy. I'm calling from the Rich Redmond Show. We want to book you on a, as a guest on the show. Is that something we could talk about of real course. quick? Of course. Thank you so much. How are you doing today? I really do want to know. what what am I? Is this a good time to talk? I'm busy. You're busy? Busy doing what? Now, if you were calling me with an offer like that, I'd make time for you. Okay. So uh, You know what I'm, that's called? Surpri surprising broker. That's what. That's a radio tool I used to use whenever I came out and I wrote a commercial. It was an attention getter. I would try and shock that that part of our brain that filters out all the bull crap. Well, I think people like the enthusiasm. Like, I can, I, I addressed what it was. This is a cold call. I, I don't like making them. You don't I, like getting that, them. I get well, it. But what I tell my people is being just completely transparent builds trust mm -hmm. and i would rather the no bullshit just tell me the truth this is what this is mm -hmm. so i mean that that works for me and i, I don't want to be on the phone long yeah so but um no that, that was good yeah. yeah so i got something bearing gifts for you i know that you were looking for this i just found a listing in you know yeah murfreesboro murfreesboro for you that's uh you know fits everything you, you want to you want to make a what's a good time this weekend for us to get together and take a look at it yeah I don't think I can add any more things to my plate, but when I look at my friends who have their real estate license, I say to myself, oh my God, I could do this. <laughs> Just because I'm a people person. Right. And showing the person the property, oh my God, right there, there's your studio, this is a great school district, look at this yard for your kids, no sharp objects, look at this, <laughs> look at look at this countertop, right? I mean, I could sell this, I mean... <laughs> I can come work for you. We'd be rocking. But I just I need I need a ninth day of the week, man. Oh man! No, uh, can you picture it? I can totally. You, oh. You're you're a natural born salesman. Well, well, most most real estate agents are pretty shitty salespeople. But they're good. I've always said. Am I allowed to say that? Can you can you make? For that? Can you, I mean, if they're not cut out for it, can you train them into the salesperson they need to be? If they yeah. don't have a sparkling natural personality, of course. Okay. Yeah, you can. I mean, salespeople are built. They're not. Right. You're just born just a little bitty person, and yeah. then you know some people are natural sales natural salespeople, but most people are not natural closers. And it's different to sell versus close. That's uh, very true. There's a big difference. Yep. There's the big boys and the little boys. But, little. but if you can make the sale feel like they're being closed, that's where the true mastery of the art comes into play. Not feeling like it's yeah, being. Exactly. You're being closed without even knowing it. Right. And that's that's something the car business teaches every single day. Car salesmen or car sales people, excuse me, are probably some of the best sales trained because they, they believe in it. Most real estate agents, they don't do any sales training. No. Well, we went over to Mercedes-Benz, and I picked up, uh, along with Jim, my little used um, cherry red Miata. I love it, man. Yeah. And, and it was a great experience. And that they have a real highly trained culture over there Well, from the top down. That organization is vastly different than a lot of automobile organizations. He leads that's a guy you need to get to know and have on your show once he comes to town his name is uh, joe agresti uh he's the ceo of dream automotive group fabulous organization all about culture first yeah he doesn't he doesn't like hiring traditional uh car sales now the rules of the culture are on a laminate yeah. around the employee's neck so yeah. they can look at it all day long and be reminded of the things that they are supposed to be doing and if there's one thing that i Eight in today's world is poor customer service, which is like 98% of the places we go. And I always complain to the manager. I hate to be that guy. Be like, look at, I just paid all this money to get in stadium seating for this show and watch this thing in IMAX. My shoes are sticking to the sticky. What is this? Right. And it, or if there's just poor service, like I'll just be like, I always tip 20%, even if they're horrible waiters, but I always say, Amen. 
you got to work on this. I agree 100 percent with that. I've worked on not complaining as much, right? But I do tip, and I don't tip for them. I tip for me. Yeah, mm-hmm. because I don't. I want people. You to feel pay like me. it comes back. I do. Yeah, I do. Well, let me ask you this: with the people that you attract, you are saying that a lot of realtors. Why do people get into it? They see they think it's easy money because they failed at everything else. Right. Usually, that's like car salespeople. A lot of people are kind of low hanging fruit. Maybe, maybe low, it is they that that. The, this is easy. And then they find out quickly it isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Because they don't, they see car salespeople, and I just had this conversation the other day with a, I was actually at another dealership and they had a room full of realtors. And it was amazing because they were just like, you know, uh, they wouldn't get up off their butts and go mingle. And they're like, well, you know, they're not going to buy. How do you, what? Yeah. These people know people. What do you think they buy after they buy a house? A car. <laughs> Go make some relationships. Jim wants a four car garage. I do. I, I said that was a little, a little extreme. I don't know, but he says he wants to have a place for two. I know exactly what I want. In my next for house. a fun car for you, for a family car. Is there a fun car for Courtney? Courtney's not a car person. Okay, so there's a fun car, a family car, and then just lots of rakes and tools and stuff, or what? No, I mean just to have the room and availability for uh, maybe a man cave or something like you that. You deserve maybe. a man cave, Courtney. If you're listening, <laughs> Jim really wants a place to set up his drums. I'm making that a note. And have a big screen TV where he can watch um, light adult films. <laughs> so, what's the best place for people to find you? GoodTimeTommy.com. Fun Grafton is that our is that our place? Yeah, that's and then what about your socials? Are you active on more on Facebook, Instagram? Is there one that's like your leading platform? I mean, for me, it's just easier to use Facebook. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's good time talking. Us old folks are there. We love it. Yeah. I mean, I got Instagram and I, I put a lot of attention into it at one time. But yeah. Uh, to me, I I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I use Instagram and say good time, Tommy D. Mm-hmm. But you can find me on those places. And then your podcast. Tell everyone about that. It's every Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. And it's on my good time, Tommy Facebook page. Okay. And it's just. He really goes live 8.30 every day. Every day. And it mm-hmm. forces me to create some type of content. But the purpose is for entertainment to maybe help people, maybe inspire them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little real estate in here. But it's. it's I think you've done it long enough where you can start putting some calls to action. And what you do, I'll be honest with you. So you know, every time you open it up and be like, "Hey, this is what we're doing today." By the way, we've got this property up for sale. If any, you know anybody, anybody who's yeah, there's that there's kind of definitely stuff. things that I could take and, and make this message better. Yeah, because I've I mean I have not forced that, and I do need to. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. There's nothing really wrong with you know taking a couple of jabs. Right Jim, now. what did you learn today? What did I learn? Yeah. You know, um, now you're putting me on the spot. What did you well, I, I'll tell you what I learned. I learned that it is no matter what season of your life you are in, it is never too late to face your fears, swim with your swim with the sharks. Blood is in the water. You will get to the other side. You will succeed if you keep that eye of the tiger. I was, uh, I learned that failure is important. Don't look at it as a bad thing. Right. Okay. Because you can always come back from it if you don't give up. You're never going to succeed unless you fail. You got to fail. Right. You got to get it embedded in your DNA. Good time, Tommy. Thanks for being here. And congratulations on your nuptials. Yeah. And do you have any gems of wisdom, little bombs you want to drop? What did you learn? Mm, Uh, Well, I I wasn't prepared for that, Jim. But what I was going to say is, um, let me tell you what I'm doing right now in my life. Hey, can I take up 30 more minutes? Mm. Go right ahead. No, no, here's here's what I want to leave people with is find one person, one mentor, and go very deep and just do what they do. And what I'm doing right now is I copy what Cardone does. And what I mean by that, in my company right now, you know, it takes, to run the company, it takes a status quo amount of money. Whatever that money is, it's got to be that. But when you're growing, you're eating all your profit. Mm -hmm. And right now, I'm just doing it anyway because that's what he says do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I I really follow him like it's a religion. Like he's your Yoda. Yes. So what I would tell people is don't follow multiple people. Follow one person and go very deep on them, Mm -hmm. and you'll learn a lot more about your instincts. You'll build a lot more awareness, and I think it'll help you get to where you want to go a lot faster. I love it. Nice. Yeah. Copy the masters. That's right. Because the results are going to be different because we're all 
so unique were snowflakes. This is a deep show, man. This, we got really I deep. Know. Tim, just think it was real estate was the launching pad That's for some shit. serious Nobody stuff. Cares about that. But hey, you know, real estate is exploding <laughs> here in Middle Tennessee, and I hope people go to a goodtimetommy.com. Thanks for being here, brother. Thank you, my man. All right, and thanks yeah. for bringing your entire entourage. We love it. Guys, thanks so much for tuning into the Rich Redmond Show. Keep coming back for the good stuff. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Tell your friends. We appreciate it. We'll see you next time. This has been the Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com forward slash podcasts.